this is not going to be a survey of cryptography. It's not going to be a condensed version of the uh, introduction to cryptography course that I teach at the undergraduate or graduate levels. Really, what I tried to do, and this was in consultation with the other people who are going to be speaking this week, is I tried to uh, select a couple of core topics, uh, and especially core topics that, um, for which we're going to be able to see some differences between the classical setting of cryptography, namely cryptography against classical adversaries, and the case of um, uh, dealing with quantum adversaries that the rest of the lecturers will be talking about. So it's really a selective, um, uh, it's, it's a select number of topics. It's not meant to be exhaustive. I'm, I'm really not going to touch at all on what happens in practice. It's going to be more theoretically oriented. Uh, and again, it's for people who um, may not have seen cryptography before. And so one thing I really wanted to get across was just the nature of the field and the idea of definitions, the idea of proofs of security, the idea of reduction-based security proofs. Um, we'll see that. We'll see a couple of examples in the lecture, uh, in the first lecture, uh, and you'll have an opportunity to practice those uh, ideas in the TA section, in the TA session later on. Um, and everything I say here, uh, when I say things, it's really only meant to apply for classical crypto. There are theorems that I'll state for classical crypto that may be slightly different or may not even apply at all in the case of quantum uh, crypto. Again, quantum crypto meaning crypto, well, meaning both um, crypto where the honest parties can use quantum mechanics as well as the case where the adversary might be using a quantum computer. So really what, what I'm going to be focusing on is, is the classical setting. Uh, and you'll see one of the themes of this week will be differences that arise when dealing with when, uh, quantum mechanics. So let's see, so, I, so I, when I put together these slides, I did not assume any prior background in cryptography, but I want to just get a sense of the audience here. So how many people here uh, have taken an undergrad or, or grad cryptography class before? Oh, okay, so it's about uh, two-thirds maybe, maybe even slightly more. So I, I think, you know, I'll try to go quickly perhaps through some of this material, but I don't want to leave behind people who, um, who have not had prior exposure. So, you know, please do feel free to stop me if you have any questions along the way. Um, I, I really would like to encourage questions. I mean, it's much more fun as a lecturer when there are questions and when the audience is engaged. So I would encourage that. Uh, people who have, who have taken undergraduate crypto, to be honest, you may not get a lot out of part one. So maybe you just want to come back for part two. Um, but, you know, anyway, we'll see, we'll see how it goes and maybe you'll pick something up along the way. Uh, I do assume some prior background in kind of standard undergraduate algorithms and discrete math. Uh, I know for people who are not computer scientists, who, who may be um, mathem mathematicians, are not going to have a problem with discrete math. Um, but some of the notation and, and some of the thinking about algorithms may, may be a little bit uh, different from what you're used to. Um, and the same if there are anybody from physics. Again, it might be a slightly different perspective, but I don't think it's anything that's going to be very difficult. I, I assume some very basic group theory. Um, I don't think it'll be a problem for anybody here. Uh, okay, so let's, let's jump in. So um, what I wanted to highlight, let's see. I'm going to just start by introducing some notation and terminology. And again, this is kind of basic terminology that people who have had undergraduate crypto will have seen. But in the spirit of getting everybody on the same page, let me go through this. So one of the core uh, goals or one of the core building blocks of cryptography is the case of encryption and specifically private key encryption. Uh, private key encryption is something that cryptographers have dealt with for hundreds of years, right, before even we had an academic field of cryptography. Uh, so this is really kind of the bread and butter of cryptography, and it's, it's sort of the nucleus out of which modern cryptography grew. So it's a good starting point for our lecture. Uh, in the context of private key encryption, what we have are two parties, two honest parties, uh, Alice on the right and Bob on the left, uh, and they want to be able to communicate over an insecure channel. Um, the way they're going to do that is they're going to agree in advance, they're going to share a key K in advance of their communication. So this is going to be called a key. I'll denote it by K. This is going to be, as we'll see, um, some random bit string that they generate and share, again, in advance of their communication over this insecure channel. Uh, when one of the parties wants to communicate with the other, they're going to have a message, which I'll sometimes also call a plain text, and I'll usually denote by M, that in this case, Bob wants to transmit to Alice. And what Bob will do in this case is he will apply some encryption algorithm using the pre-shared key K, as well as the message M that he wants to communicate. He'll run that algorithm to generate what we'll call a ciphertext C. And that ciphertext is what he's going to transmit across the channel. 
At the other end, when Alice receives that ciphertext, she'll apply some decryption algorithm to the ciphertext. The decryption algorithm will also use the same shared key that Bob used to encrypt. And that will regenerate or it will allow Alice to recover the uh, message M that Bob wanted to communicate. And the goal at a high level, and we'll spend a little bit of time actually formalizing this goal, but the goal at a high level is that if we have an adversary who's eavesdropping on this communication between Alice and Bob and is able to observe the ciphertext C that Bob sends in this case, that adversary should get no information or we want the adversary not to be able to learn the message M that Bob sent. Okay, so the terminology here is basically we had the key, we had the encryption and decryption algorithms, we have the message, and we have the ciphertext. A little bit more formally, we can define a private key encryption scheme uh, by a message space M that's going to be the set of allowable messages, the set of messages that Bob can choose from when he decides to send something to Alice. Uh, and a triple of algorithms, uh, a key generation algorithm, an encryption algorithm, and a decryption algorithm. Uh, the key generation algorithm is what the parties are going to use to generate this key, K, that they're going to share. Uh, we'll denote by uh, script K, the capital script K there on the right, the set of all possible keys that can be output by this key generation algorithm. The encryption algorithm is going to be an algorithm that takes as input a key K and a message M. Now, even though I've denoted it in this way by subscripting the key and then giving the message M as explicit input, you should really think of this as an algorithm just taking a pair of inputs. It's just convenient to subscript the key. Uh, it takes the key and the message as input, and it's going to output a ciphertext C. And the decryption algorithm will take as input uh, a key K and a ciphertext C, and it's going to output either a message M in the message space, or we also are going to allow it to possibly output an error. And I, I think I have this later on, but let me just mention it now since I see it's come up a couple of times already. I'm using slightly different notation here, and the reason for that is that when I use this notation with the arrow, um, that's usually intended or that is intended to highlight the fact that the encryption algorithm is randomized, by which I mean that when you run it multiple times, even on the same inputs, it may possibly generate different outputs. And in contrast, this, uh, you know, the colon equal, which is meant like an assignment, uh, this is meant to indicate that the decryption algorithm we're going to assume without loss of generality is deterministic. So you run it many times on the same inputs, it will always give you the same result as output. Uh, for now, you can kind of ignore the distinction, but it'll become important later. Okay, and we want a basic correctness criterion, which is that uh, this encryption scheme should allow Alice to recover the message that Bob sent. So namely, for every message in the message space, every key output by the key generation algorithm, if you encrypt uh, M using the key K, then regardless of what ciphertext you get out, when you decrypt that ciphertext using the key, you should recover the original message. Good. For defining security, one thing I want to point out, and this is something that I think people who, are, um, uh, who work in the field are kind of familiar with at, at this point, but it's something that's not immediately obvious to people who come from outside the field, is that we're going to assume um, Kirchhoff's principle, which is that when we think about the adversary trying to figure out what message was sent by Bob to Alice in that diagram we had earlier, and we think about what the adversary might know and what the adversary might not know, so we're always going to assume that the attacker knows the full details of all the algorithms that the honest parties are using. So the attacker knows the key generation algorithm, the attacker knows the encryption algorithm, the attacker knows the decryption algorithm, the attacker knows the message space, uh, the attacker knows all of that. The only thing that the attacker does not know is going to be the key that the party shared. Okay, so again, the attacker knows the key generation algorithm, so it knows what the key space is. It knows even what the distribution over the key space is going to be, but it doesn't know the actual key that the party shared uh, in advance. Okay? We don't want to assume that the encryption algorithm itself is secret. And when we start to think about how we might want to define security, this gives me kind of an opportunity to talk about these three, what, what I would call core principles of modern cryptography. Um, and this kind of distinguishes modern cryptography, which I would call uh, maybe cryptography as developed in academia from the early 1980s on, with all the historical work on cryptography that preceded the 1980s, right? I said that cryptography and, and private key encryption in particular were used for hundreds of years uh, before that, but it really uh, did not develop into a scientific field until starting in the 1980s or so. And these core principles are, first of all, we want to develop formal definitions of security. Okay, I, the picture I gave before um, uh, of, of the Bob sending the ciphertext to Alice and then the attacker looking in and observing the ciphertext and not being able to figure out anything about the message, 
That was very nice as intuition, but it was not sufficiently formal for us to be able to work with it and prove things about. We want to actually write down formal definitions that we can then argue about. Um, and that's actually something that was really an insight developed in the 1980s. It was something that people did not really think was very important, or at least did not um, consider uh, prior to that time. Uh, jumping ahead to the third bullet, we're also going to want to be able to give proofs of security for the schemes that we develop. What we want is to be able to take a particular scheme, point to a particular definition, and then give a proof showing that this encryption scheme or this cryptographic scheme in general does indeed satisfy that definition. <clears throat> and again, this is something that was uh, a, a real departure from what had happened prior to the 1980s, where it was really a, a lot more about heuristic analysis um, and, and really ad hoc kind of techniques developed to analyze schemes. And again, again, in the early 1980s, people said, well, it would be really nice if we could actually prove things about the schemes that we use. Now, in general, uh, it's often not possible to give unconditional proofs of security for cryptographic schemes. Sometimes it is possible. We'll see an example actually soon where it is possible. But in many interesting settings, it's not possible. And what we need to do in that case is to give conditional proofs of security, where those conditional proofs of security are based on some particular assumptions. Um, the key point here is just that those assumptions need to be made explicit, and they again also need to be written out formally enough that we can use them inside the proof, that we can understand what they're talking about, and that we can analyze them and determine whether or not those assumptions are actually uh, reasonable or not, and maybe even eventually prove that the assumptions in fact hold unconditionally. That would be sort of a, 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 a holy grail, as it were, for the field. Um, in general, that seems very hard to do, but maybe in some particular cases you may be able to prove some assumptions uh, actually hold unconditionally. Um, when we come again to crypto definitions, there are generally two parts to a cryptographic definition. Uh, one part is thinking through what the security goal is, or flipping it around, kind of, you know, what, what kind of guarantee do we want to provide for the, for the scheme? Uh, you know, either you can think about it as what the honest parties want to achieve or what they want to prevent the attacker from achieving. And then we also want to think through uh, the threat model. Namely, what kind of real-world capabilities are we assuming that the attacker has and then making sure that we build in those capabilities in, into the definition that we come up with. And we'll see some of this as well as we develop several different definitions of security for private key encryption. Uh, any questions so far? Everyone's good? It's kind of, uh, did I lose anybody yet? I don't think so. OK. Well, I shouldn't say that. You can tell me if I did. All right, so let's think about, again, how we might define uh, secure private key encryption. This is just a review of the terminology here. Um, so what do we want informally? Well, first of all, if we think through what I had on the previous slide, thinking about the goal, I already said that intuitively the goal, what we're trying to achieve here is, um, uh, right, so the, the, the first part of this bullet really is about the goal. We'll come back to that in a minute. But intuitively, we want to capture this idea that the attacker is learning nothing about the message uh, given the ciphertext that it observes. And in terms of the threat model, what we're going to be capturing in the definition I give on the next couple of slides is the most basic kind of attack we can consider, the most basic threat model we can think about, which corresponds to the picture that I've been showing, where there's only one ciphertext being sent across the channel, and the attacker is just passively eavesdropping that ciphertext. So I'm going to call this the, the, the idea of the attacker only passively eavesdropping on the channel is called a ciphertext-only attack, because the only information available to the attacker uh, from the channel is the ciphertext. And it's going to be only a single ciphertext being transmitted across the channel. So thinking about how we might define this, right? what we want to um, write is a mathematical definition that will capture the intuition on this slide. Namely, that regardless of any prior information the attacker might have about the plaintext, the ciphertext that the attacker observes should leak no additional information about that message. Okay, so there's a couple of important things here. And again, we'll see in a minute how this is formalized mathematically. But two things I want to point out here is that, first of all, uh, we don't want to make any assumptions about what prior information the attacker might have on what message the honest party is going to be sending. It's not really reasonable to assume that the honest sender is picking a message uniformly from the message space, because in real life, that's not how things work. Right? First of all, in real life, real languages are not uniform strings over some alphabet, they're very structured. And even more than that, right, the attacker might have some uh, additional information that allows it to narrow down the space of possible messages that Bob might be sending. And in, and in an extreme case, for example, it might know that Bob is answering a yes and no question. 
And so the possible messages that Bob would be sending in that case are either yes or no. And let's just say the attacker may even know that it's 60% likely uh, that, that, the, that Bob's answer will be yes, and maybe only with 40% probability uh, Bob's answer will be no. So we want the scheme to provide security regardless of any prior information the attacker might have on what Bob is sending. And secondly, we also want this encryption scheme to, uh, to have the property that the ciphertext will leak nothing additional about the plaintext. It would not be considered sufficiently secure if the scheme leaked uh, a bit of information about the plaintext, even if we think that bit of information is unimportant in some particular context. Right? We don't know what context the scheme will be used in. We want to provide a, a definition that's robust and that can be used in many different places. And so we want it really to be a strong definition, and we want the ciphertext to leak nothing about the plaintext. So we can formalize this uh, by the notion of perfect secrecy. Um, so just so a little bit more terminology. I defined already the key space, which was the set of all possible keys. Uh, we have the uh, script C denoting the ciphertext space, which is just going to be the set of all possible ciphertext, the set of all possible strings that can be output by the encryption algorithm for all keys and for all messages. Um, and I'm going to let capital M here denote, be the random variable denoting the value of the message. OK, so note that. It's a little bit confusing here for me as a speaker because there are so many M's on the, screen, on the slide. But we have capital M, which is a random variable, ranging over the set uh, script M, which is the message space, namely the set of all supported messages of the scheme. Uh, and as I said earlier, this is going to allow us to encapsulate the attacker's prior knowledge about what Bob might be sending. So again, it might be in some, and again, this is in a, in a particular example, this might, it might be the case that the probability uh, that M is equal to attack today is 0.7, and the probability that m equals don't attack is 0.3. So this is a, a scenario where the, the uh, adversary knows that Bob is sending a message to Alice telling her whether to attack or not. And it even has some prior information that the probability that Bob will say attack is 70%. Okay, so again, this, all this prior information about the, uh, that the attacker has is encapsulated in that random variable. Um, I'm going to let capital K be a random variable uh, corresponding to the key that's chosen. So that random variable ranges over the key space. And once we fix some encryption scheme, notice that that defines a probability distribution for that random variable k. Right? The probability that the random variable k takes on any particular value uh, little, k, little k is exactly the probability that the key generation algorithm outputs that key. And we're going to assume that the random variables uh, m and k are independent. What does that mean in practice? That means that we're going to assume that the message that one of the honest parties wants to send is determined independently of the key that the parties chose to share in advance. Okay? And basically what that means is that they don't pick the key based on the message or the message based on the key. It's a very natural kind of assumption to make. Uh, in general, it actually does hold. There can be cases, in fact, where it does not hold. But if it does not hold, you actually run into problems. Uh, and so it's not like a, like a problem with the definition. It's really a problem with the application if, if it's doing that. Good. So if we fix some encryption scheme and some and, and now we also fix some distribution on the message base, right? The, the distribution on the message base is context dependent. It's not defined by the encryption scheme itself. And we can consider the following experiment. What we'll do is we'll generate a key using the key generation algorithm. We'll pick a message M according to the given distribution, namely the distribution defined by the random variable capital M. And then we'll run the encryption algorithm on the key that we chose and the message that we chose as well to obtain some ciphertext C. Okay, this is a well-defined randomized experiment which defines a distribution on the ciphertext. So if we now let capital C be a random variable uh, denoting the value of the ciphertext in that experiment, right, that random variable is well-defined once we fix an encryption scheme and fix some distribution on the message space. So if we now want to try to capture this, uh, this uh, intuition I mentioned earlier, um, we can do that by comparing the distribution of the random variable m before and after the attacker observes the ciphertext. So what we can do is we can say that an encryption scheme is perfectly secret <clears throat> if for every possible distribution over the message space, every message in that message space, and every ciphertext with uh, non-zero probability that, that can occur with non-zero probability in that randomized experiment I showed earlier, the probability that the message takes on the value m, 
conditioned on the fact that the ciphertext took on a particular value c is exactly equal to the prior probability that the message took on the value m. Okay. Is there a laser pointer, by the way, or, or uh, no? OK, in any event. Uh, so the, the expression on the right-hand side corresponds to the attacker's prior knowledge about the likelihood that the message takes on any particular value m. The value on the left-hand side corresponds to the attacker's a posteriori knowledge about the probability that the message took on a particular value conditioned on the ciphertext that the attacker happened to observe being sent across the channel. OK, so another way of saying this is that the distribution of the random variable does not change, even conditioned on the attacker's observation of the ciphertext. So this brings us to the, uh, the one-time pad. Um, for the one-time pad, we're going to take, uh, let n be a variable. It can take on any, uh, any integer value. That notation 0, 1 to the n just refers to the set of all n-bit strings. Uh, we're going to take the message space to be exactly that set. So we're going to allow uh, any n-bit string to be a valid message. The key generation algorithm will choose a uniform uh, n-bit key. And then to encrypt, what we'll do is we'll simply XOR the key and the message. And that gives us the ciphertext. To decrypt the ciphertext, we'll simply XOR the key with the ciphertext to recover the original message. And you can easily check that that will give you back the original message that was uh, encrypted. So this is kind of in pictures here. What we have is a message, an n-bit message coming in on the left, an n-bit key uh, that the parties share. And those are XOR together to give the ciphertext. This, is, this uh, diagram here, the direction of the arrows, represents encryption. When you want to decrypt, you just kind of reverse the direction of the, uh, of the horizontal arrows. Then you have the ciphertext coming in, the key coming in as well, and those are XORed to recover the original message. So the theorem is that the one-time pad is perfectly secret. This is not too uh, difficult to show, but I'll go through it quickly for people who haven't uh, seen it before, perhaps. So what we need to show, again, is that for an arbitrary distribution over the message space and for any message M, et cetera, uh, that the a posteriori probability that the message takes on a particular value m, conditioned on observing the ciphertext, is exactly equal to the prior probability of the message taking on that value. So let's fix some arbitrary distribution over the message space and fix some arbitrary um, message in ciphertext. So we can calculate, uh, using Bayes' rule, uh, the probability that the message was m conditioned on the fact that the ciphertext was c. So this is just going to be equal to the probability that the ciphertext is C conditioned on the message being M times the prior probability that the message was M divided by the probability that the ciphertext takes on the value C. Uh, we can compute the probability that the ciphertext takes on a particular value C by um, uh, the law of total probability. Right? We can just take a summation over all possible messages M prime of the probability that the ciphertext is C conditioned on the message being equal to M prime times the probability that the message is, in fact, equal to m prime. Um, so until now, we haven't actually used any specific properties of the one-time pad encryption scheme. But now what we'll do is we'll use exactly the definition of the one-time pad to calculate or start calculating the probability that the ciphertext is C conditioned on the fact that the message is m. So when is the, in the one-time pad encryption scheme, when is the ciphertext equal to C conditioned on the fact that the message is m prime? Well, that occurs exactly when the random variable corresponding to the key takes on the particular value of m prime xor with c. Okay, so this capital K is a random variable. m prime xor with c is a particular n-bit string. Because key generation chooses the key uniformly from the space of n-bit keys, that probability is exactly 1 over 2 to the n. Okay, so this simplifies here to the summation over all messages at m prime, 2 to the minus n times the probability of the message being equal to m prime which is just 2 to the minus n. OK, um, so that allows us, again, to go back here and, uh, and express the uh, posterior probability that m equals m uh, in the following way. And that reduces exactly to the probability that m is equal to m. So why is that again? Well, maybe I won't, maybe I won't do this too quickly. Um, so again, using the specific properties of the one-time pad encryption scheme, the probability that the ciphertext is C conditioned on M being M is exactly the probability that the key happened to be M X or C. Because we're picking the key uniformly, that's exactly 2 to the minus N. Things cancel, and we just get back to the prior probability that M equals N. Okay, so I know this is old school for people who have seen it before, but anybody who has not seen it before, uh, let me know if you have any questions. It was really just a basic uh, probability calculation using Bayes. Bayes' law.
So let me just talk briefly about some limitations of the one-time pad. So first of all, the, the first maybe thing you might think about is that the key is as long as the message. And you know, when we're talking on, on a PowerPoint slide, we might think, oh, n might be 20 or 30 or whatever, no big deal. But right in practice, you want to encrypt megabytes of information, gigabytes of information, terabytes of information. You don't want to have to, sh have to store uh, and share a key that's going to be that long. That's kind of annoying. And secondly, I didn't really highlight this so far, but um, one of the limitations of the one-time pad and the reason for the name one time is because the scheme is, is actually only secure if each key is used to encrypt a single message. Okay, I mean, that's fine. The definition only talked about encryption of a single message. But if you think about using the scheme in practice, the scheme will actually break down once you start using the same key to encrypt more than one uh, message. And what that means is that the parties must then share keys of total length equal to the total length of all the messages they might ever send to each other. So it's actually really bad and really inconvenient uh, from that point of view. Just looking quickly at what, what the problem is if you use the same key twice. Um, so let's, let's imagine that the parties use the same key to encrypt messages M1 and M2. Well, what that means is that from the attacker's point of view, they observe on the channel uh, ciphertext C1 and C2. But what the attacker can then do is it can take those two ciphertexts that it observes and it can XOR them together. And when it does that, you'll see that the key cancels and the attacker learns the XOR of M1 and M2. So what that tells you is that this is leaking information about the, about the joint distribution of M1 and M2. Okay? It's certainly leaking something from an information theoretic point of view. It's actually bad even in practice because what it leaks is exactly the bit positions where M M1 and M2 differ. Uh, and you can really use this in practice to, to, to uh, recover M1 and M2 in their entirety, depending on how long they are, depending on some other assumptions. But at least from a definitional point of view, it's clear that this leaks some information, and therefore the one-time pad is not going to be secure with respect to a stronger definition that would look at distributions over pairs of messages and then allow Bob to encrypt twice. Good. So what I want to say here is that these drawbacks are, are real, um, and they're not just drawbacks that are specific to the one-time pad. In fact, you can show that these limitations are inherent for all schemes achieving perfect secrecy. Okay, so it's not a problem with the one-time pad. It's a limitation. It's an inherent limitation of the definition of perfect secrecy. And I'm just going to uh, quickly you know, state the theorem and, and give a high-level sketch of the proof for the first of those, um, namely um, the fact that the key has to be as long as the message. And so what I'll say more formally is that if you have an encryption scheme, with a message space uh, M that's perfectly secret, then it must be the case that the size of the key space, the number of keys in the key space, is at least equal to the number of messages in the message space. So thinking about this in terms of the length of the messages uh, and the length of the keys and taking the logarithms of both sides, you see that the length of the key has to be at least the length of the message. <clears throat> and the, the formal proof is not that difficult, but let me just give the, the intuition here. Well, the basic idea is that there's an attack that, that can always be carried out regardless of the encryption scheme you're using. Uh, and this attack is possible exactly because we assume the attacker knows the details of the encryption scheme and the only unknown is the key. So what the attacker can always do is take a ciphertext that it sees being sent across the channel and simply try decrypting under every possible key in the key space, right? The attacker doesn't know the key, but it knows it has to be one of the possible uh, elements in that key space. And that's going to give it a list of up to size of k possible messages. Okay, those are all the possibilities that remain after decrypting the given observed ciphertext with all possible keys. And so if the key space is smaller than the message space, that means that some message is not on the list and is thereby excluded uh, by, what the, by the ciphertext the attacker observed. Okay, and that's information. Uh, and, uh, and so that tells you that the scheme cannot be perfectly secure if k is less than m. Good. OK, so where do things stand here? This is where things start to get interesting. So we've defined the notion of perfect secrecy. Uh, we've showed that the one-time pad achieves it, which is great. Uh, we've also showed that the one-time pad is optimal. We can't improve on the one-time pad. And yet we have these limitations that are going to make the one-time pad really unusable in practice. So what can we do? Right? Where do we go from here? Well, what we can do is we can try to do better by relaxing the definition of perfect secrecy. We want to relax that definition in a meaningful way to give us something that's still going to be meaningful for use in practice, but that will allow us then to circumvent the limitations that perfect secrecy uh, comes with. 
So if we revisit right, the definition of perfect secrecy, it, what it required was that absolutely no information about the plain text was leaked, even to an eavesdropper with unlimited computational power. Right? We didn't place any bounds on the computational power of the adversary. The definition we gave was entirely information theoretic. And uh, this may seem, or it's, it's, you know, I, I would argue that, it's, that it is uh, unnecessarily strong. So first of all, it would be OK uh, if a scheme did leak information with some tiny probability. Okay? Or maybe flip, you can think of it also as leaking some very small uh, you know, fraction of a bit of information. Um, right? That might be OK. It may also be OK if it leaked that information only to, um, uh, to eavesdroppers running for a very long period of time. Or flipping it around, if you, have, uh, if you restrict your attention only to attackers running for some bounded amount of time, or having some bounded computational resources, the scheme would not leak that information. Okay? So again, it would be OK if the scheme did leak information with a small probability, uh, and we only restrict our attention to attackers with some bound on their running time or the amount of computational resources they use. Right? This would suffice in practice. Right? So we can, again, we'll allow security to quote unquote fail with a very small probability, and we'll restrict our attention only to efficient attackers rather than to attackers who might have to run for something on the order of the lifetime of the universe. So, you know, I, I'll just go through this quickly for people who haven't seen this before. Right? Why is it OK to make these relaxations? Well, first of all, the, the kind of things we're going to be talking about in cryptography when we talk about small probabilities are really small. Okay? Think about, you know, don't think about security failing with probability 1 out of 100. Think about security failing with probability something like 2 to the minus 60 or even smaller. And you really should not be concerned about an encryption scheme where security fails with probability 2 to the minus 60. Um, right? Because with, with probability more than 2 to the minus 60, both the sender and receiver are struck by lightning in the coming year. All right? So that's a small probability. And if you care about probabilities that are that small, you have other you know, bigger problems to worry about. Okay? Uh, you have other things that also happen. Right? With probability 2 to the minus 60, you know, the laptop of one of the, of one of the parties is hit by a cosmic ray, and it causes a bit flip that you know, m m makes zeros out the key or something like that. So these are really small probabilities, and, and they really don't matter in, in practice. Uh, so these are just some calculations. And, and as far as restricting attention to bounded attackers, again, this comes back to what I talked about earlier, the fact that we don't really care about the fact that there might be an attacker who can break security of the encryption scheme, but that attack or that attacker would be required to run for some infeasible amount of time. Right? So if we think, for example, just to get, get, put some numbers out there, right? think about the, um, the attack I showed earlier that was used to argue that the key space for perfect secrecy had to be as large as the message space. Right, the attack there required the attacker to decrypt the ciphertext using every possible key. That's equivalent to a brute force enumeration over all the keys in the key space. So let's just you know, do a calculation and think about how long that might take. Uh, and assume here that one key can be tested per clock cycle, which is a, an overly optimistic assumption. So you know, what that tells you is that a desktop computer can do a brute force search over the order of 2 to the 57 keys per year. Uh, a supercomputer can do on the order of 2 to the 80 keys per year, uh, and a supercomputer running since the Big Bang could search over 2 to the 112 keys. Okay? That's assuming it was running continuously and that they had access to customer support during the first couple of uh, millennia. So the, the, the point of this is that if we restrict our attention to attackers who are limited to trying 2 to the 112 keys, or maybe equivalently limited to running 2 to the 112 clock cycles, that is fine. Okay, that, that is perfectly valid security and perfectly meaningful security in the real world. And in practice, modern key spaces are larger. Modern key spaces are at least 2 to the 128, uh, if not even larger nowadays. And so really, um, it, it's fine to restrict attention to attackers running for time much smaller than the amount of time required to do that brute force search. Okay. So I'm going to give an alternate definition of perfect secrecy. Um, and that definition is going to have a natural relaxation that's going to give us what, what I'll call computational security or computational secrecy. So the definition I want to give is uh, I'm going to call perfect indistinguishability. So I'm going to just set up the randomized experiment. But to tell you where I'm going, right, this is going to give us a definition that turns out to be exactly equivalent to the definition of perfect secrecy I gave earlier. The nice thing, what I like about this definition, is that it's a little bit more algorithmic in flavor. And it's kind of the, um, the, the framework that we use 
when we define uh, computationally secure encryption um, uh, from, from here on in. So again, let's let, uh, you know, fix some encryption scheme defined by key generation encryption and decryption algorithms, uh, fix a message space M. Um, let me just go straight to the formal definition here. Good. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider, uh, let A be an adversary. What that adversary is going to do is it's going to first run for some amount of time and then select two messages, M0 and M1, from the message space. Okay, it can choose any two messages it likes. What we're then going to do is we're going to then choose one of those messages at random and encrypt it. So we're going to generate a key using the key generation algorithm. We're going to choose a uniform bit, uh, B, so selecting between the two messages with equal probability. And then we encrypt that message that we chose using the key that we generated. And that gives us a ciphertext C. Uh, and I'll call C the challenge ciphertext. We then give the attacker the challenge ciphertext and ask it to output its guess, B prime, uh, corresponding to which of the two messages is the one that was encrypted. So the attacker is now trying to determine which message was encrypted. It outputs, it can run for a while, think about it, and then outputs a guess B prime. And we'll say the attacker succeeds if its guess is correct, namely if B is equal to B prime. Uh, and we'll say the experiment evaluates to one in this case. So I just defined some notation here, prime K, uh, corresponding to the experiment listed here for the particular encryption scheme pi and some particular adversary A. Um, so notice it's easy, easy to succeed with probability half. If the attacker outputs a random bit, it's correct with probability half. Um, what we want to say is that no efficient attacker, sorry, no attacker can do better than that. And we'll say that a scheme pi is perfectly indistinguishable if for all attackers, namely all possible algorithms A, it holds that the probability that that experiment, right, using encryption scheme pi and for that particular adversary A, the probability that that experiment evaluates to one is exactly one half. So no attacker can do any different from uh, succeeding with, with probability one half in that experiment I defined on the previous slide. Okay? And the claim, which I'm not going to prove here, it's actually a bit of a pain to prove, but it's not inherently very difficult, is just that a scheme pi is perfectly indistinguishable if and only if it's perfectly secret. So this is just a reformulation of the definition of perfect secrecy that we gave earlier. Great. So now we can think about how we might relax the definition. And what I said earlier is that there are two uh, axes along which we want to relax it. So first of all, we want to allow for some small probability that the scheme can fail, as it were. And number two, we also want to restrict our attention only to efficient attackers. So there are two uh, ways we can go about doing that, one which is called concrete security, one which is called asymptotic security. Uh, let me walk through those here. So for computational um, uh, indistinguishability with uh, using concrete security, what we might do is define some notion that I'll call T epsilon indistinguishability. And what this will basically do is it will, you can think of it as allowing security to quote unquote fail with probability at most epsilon, um, and we'll restrict our attention only to attackers running in time at most t. And you know, wh whether you want to measure t in, 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 in wall clock time or in CPU cycles or in steps on a Turing machine is up to you, but it's going to you know, be some measure of the amount of time the attacker takes uh, when running that experiment. And what we might say then is that a scheme pi is t epsilon indistinguishable if for all attackers a running in time at most t, it holds that the probability that that experiment I talked about earlier evaluates to one is at most one half plus epsilon. Okay, so we're, we're getting the little plus epsilon on the right hand side. It's no longer exactly equal to one half. The attacker might be able to succeed with probability one half plus two to the minus 60. Um, and we're also restricting attention right before the definition was looking at all possible attackers regardless of their running time. Now we're restricting our attention only to attackers running in time at most t. Uh, and, uh, you know, infinity zero indistinguishability corresponds to perfect indistinguishability, so you see how it's really a relaxation on both those axes. So I, I just want to make a brief remark. So I, th I think throughout this uh, week, my guess is that most of the lecturers are going to be focusing on asymptotic security, uh, maybe not in some cases. But in the real world, I, so asymptotic security is nice theoretically, and it has lots of nice properties. It's a little bit easier to work with, but I just want to highlight the fact that in the real world, uh, concrete security is what we ultimately care about. So, you know, even when you do all these analyses with uh, asymptotic security, 
when you then go to instantiate the scheme in the real world, you have to do the calculations and figure out exactly what you're going to want to set t epsilon to and what that would mean for the parameters of the scheme. Right? Because again, in the real world, you have to make some determination of how large of an epsilon is acceptable for you. And uh, for the class of adversaries you care about, what value of t would be appropriate. Right? There's a difference, perhaps, well, there is a difference between trying to defend against you know, your neighbor eavesdropping on your Wi-Fi versus a nation state trying to crack government secrets okay? and the amount of computational resources they may be able to invest. Good. Um, for, a, for the asymptotic definition, what we'll do is we'll introduce this idea of what's called a security parameter n. Uh, the security parameter allows us to introduce asymptotics into the scheme. You can think about it as uh, being equivalent to the length of the key. Uh, and it's something that's going to be chosen by the honest parties when they, uh, at the time of key generation. And it allows the users, as it were, to kind of tailor the security level. So you can think about the security param parameter as, a, as giving the honest parties a knob that they can turn, and they can dial up the knob if they kind of want more security. Um, r really, n, think about as a, as a parameter that's, that's um, going to be used to, me to measure the security of the scheme as n increases. What we'll do is we'll then measure the running times of all the parties and the success probability of the adversary as functions of n, and then look at the asymptotic behavior. Um, we'll allow then security to fail with probability negligible in n. This is what's going to constitute a small probability of failure for us. And as far as the running time, what we're going to do is restrict our attention to attackers running in time polynomial in n. So just briefly to introduce this, right? so we'll say a function is polynomial. Uh, if f of n is bounded by n to the c for some constant c. Uh, and we'll say a function is negligible if for every polynomial p, uh, f of n is less than 1 over p of n for n large enough. So basically, that just means that um, f is negligible if it decays faster than any inverse polynomial. And a typical example would be something like polynomial in n times uh, a, a negative exponential in n. But there, there are other examples, too. Uh, let me skip this, perhaps. OK. So we can redefine encryption then right, by looking at the same randomized experiment we had before, but now incorporating these uh, relaxations I talked about on the last couple of slides. So what we'll now do is well, let me first um, just quickly redefine encryption in this setting, because now we also want the encryption scheme to be computationally efficient. We have to also incorporate the security parameter into the encryption scheme. So we'll have now, uh, again, our three algorithms, gen, ank, and dec. We're now going to require that they be um, PPT, which stands for probabilistic polynomial time. So we allow them to be randomized, but we're going to require that they all be efficient. They all have to run in polynomial time in the lengths of their inputs. Um, the key generation algorithm is going to take as input the security parameter in a unary, so a sequence of n1s. And then it's going to output uh, an n bit, well, it's going to output a key k. We'll just assume that the length of the key is at least n. The encryption algorithm is going to take as input a key k. We're now going to allow uh, the message space to be unbounded. So we're going to allow the message m to be a bit string of arbitrary length. Uh, and then the encryption algorithm is going to output a ciphertext c. And again, decryption will take a key and a ciphertext and output a message m or uh, an error symbol. Good. And this is really the same experiment we had before. Actually, it is the same experiment. Um, it's just the, the next slide is going to be a little different. But let me just walk through it again. So we fixed some schemes, some particular encryption scheme pi we're analyzing. In the randomized experiment, we, we plug in some adversary A. That allows us to define the following randomized experiment. Um, the algorithm A is going to be given the security parameter as input, so it knows kind of uh, how long it has to run. It knows how long the key is that the parties are using. And then it eventually is going to output a pair of messages, m0, m1. We're going to require those messages to be of equal length, um, basically because you, you, you can't have an encryption scheme that hides the length completely, but anyway, we're going we're to allow them to be, we're going to require them to be of equal length. Um, then we do the same thing as we did previously. We're going to generate a key k. We're going to choose one of those two messages, uh, each with equal probability. And then we're going to encrypt the message that we selected using the key that we chose to get some ciphertext c. We give that ciphertext to the attacker, who's allowed to maintain state from step one to step three. Uh, and then eventually the attacker outputs a guess B prime, just like it did before. And we'll say the attacker succeeds if its guess is correct, and the experiment evaluates to 1 in that case. And then we'll say that a scheme pi is computationally indistinguishable, also called Eve secure, if for all probabilistic polynomial time attackers A, there's a negligible function epsilon such that the probability that A 
um, th th that that experiment on the previous slide evaluates to one is at most one half plus negligible. And again, I'll just highlight here, it's a, it's a little bit um, much maybe to unpack, but I want to highlight here the fact that the left-hand side of this expression is a function in n, right? You fix some scheme pi, you fix some attacker a, that attacker a has some polynomial running time. It could be any polynomial, but it has to be polynomial. You can then, right, that experiment is then well-defined for every value of n. So for any value of n, you can run the experiment, you can run it, you, do, you can do the calculation, you can simulate it, whatever, you get a value of the probability uh, that that experiment returns one for that particular value of n. If you do that for all values of n, you get a function of n, a function of the security parameter on the left-hand side. And the requirement is that whatever that function is, there has to be some negligible function epsilon such that that function is bounded by one-half plus epsilon, or, or that function minus one-half is bounded by epsilon. Good. So uh, everyone good so far? OK, so now let's see how we can maybe realize a, um, a non-trivial uh, scheme that's computationally secure. So to do that, I'm going to have to take a detour to talk a little bit about pseudo-randomness. Um, you know, th this is what I give to my undergrads, but I think people here probably know about this already. But let me just go through it again, right? So what does it mean when we say that something is random? Well, you have to be a little bit careful. So if I gave you, like, three strings, right, this is one of these classic questions. If I gave you one of these three strings, right, which of these strings is uniform and which of these strings is not uniform? Well, I, I mean, hopefully you realize that there's not really an answer to that. I mean, even though you, you want to say that the all zero string is not uniform, right, in fact, right, the probability, well, let me say it differently, if we generated a uniform 16-bit string, each of those three strings occurs with the same exact probability, 2 to the minus 16. So from that point of view, none of those strings is any more random or more uniform than any other of those strings. So rather, randomness is not a property of a string, it's really a property of a distribution. I mean, that's the main point. Uh, you all know what a distribution is, so I think that's fine. Um, so what, it, what then does it mean to be pseudo-random? So the same thing, right? So informally, it means that we have a string and we can't distinguish it from uniform. But of course, that's not what we really mean, because again, it doesn't make sense to talk about any particular bit string being, being pseudo-random or not. Rather, what it makes sense to talk about is whether or not a particular distribution is pseudo-random or not. So what does it mean for a distribution to be pseudo-random? Well, let's fix some distribution D on n-bit strings. And then when I write this notation here, x left arrow D, that just means that I'm going to sample a string x according to distribution D. So historically, people, might, uh, people did say, right, and this was kind of in, in the notion of, um, um, I'm blanking on an exact phrase, but it's like Monte Carlo algorithms and Monte Carlo simulations that were considered uh, around World War II, people talked about, you know, notions of pseudorandomness for distributions, and what they said was that they would consider a distribution to be pseudorandom if it passed a bunch of different statistical tests. So what does that mean? Well, you can think about a statistical test <clears throat> as defining a predicate over some set of strings, or over strings, um, and then you can look at, for example, right, what's the probability when you choose x from this distribution d that the first bit of x is equal to 1? And clearly, if that distribution d, if we're going to call it pseudo-random, that probability had better be close to what we expect for the probability that the first bit of x is 1 when x is chosen from the uniform distribution. So namely, that when we sample x according to d, the probability that the first bit of x should be 1 should be about 1 half. And maybe you can even think about it should be 1 half plus like 2 to the minus 60. Uh, similarly, right, another example of a test is we can look at the parity of x. Uh, and so we would want that if we sample x according to d, the, the probability that the parity of x is 1 should be about 1 half. And you can do that for as many statistical tests as you like. So that's, that's great, right? We can enumerate a bunch that we care about and then ask that, the, um, that for each of those, the probability that, um, that x passes that test when chosen from distribution d is close to the probability that it passes that test when x is chosen from the uniform distribution. It doesn't have to be half. You could look at the first two bits of x if you like. <clears throat> now, the point is that this kind of an approach is not sufficient in the cryptographic setting when we have an adversary that we're dealing with and we don't know in advance what kind of algorithm that adversary will run. Right? We don't know in advance what kind of statistical test the attacker might come up with or what kind of test they might care about. And so a more robust definition that would be uh, applicable to the context of cryptography is that we'll say that D is pseudo-random if it passes all efficient statistical tests. 
So what might that mean? Uh, that would mean, well, I guess I didn't put out the definition here, but it, it might mean something like, like um, that for all tests t running in some time little t, the probability when x is chosen from d that t of x is equal to 1 should be, uh, uh, well, minus the probability that, um, that x chosen from the uniform distribution uh, t of x is equal to 1 should be, the absolute value of that should be bounded by epsilon. And that would be kind of the, an, a, a concrete approach to that definition. Um, in the asymptotic setting, it gets a little bit more complicated because there what we're looking at is not the pseudo-randomness of any particular distribution, but rather a sequence of distributions, an infinite sequence of distributions. So if we let d sub n denote a distribution over strings of length p of n, where p is some polynomial, then we can consider the sequence uh, d of n, right, where, where, where n ranges from 1 to infinity. And we'll say that that sequence is pseudo-random if for all probabilistic polynomial time distinguishers A, so the distinguisher A, the adversary here, is playing the role of, of the statistical test. We're equating the adversary with a particular statistical test. So for all probabilistic polynomial time distinguishers A, there should be a negligible function epsilon such that the absolute value of these differences here, which is what I, what I talked to earlier, namely the difference in probabilities uh, between the probability that A of X outputs 1 when X is sampled from D of N, and the probability that A of X equals 1 when X is sampled from the uniform distribution over PN bit strings, that difference should be bounded by some negligible function epsilon. Okay. I think I get, I get worried when I have no questions, because then I, I, I think that two-thirds of the, of, the, of the room has seen this before, and one-third is completely lost. But you can let me know if that's the case. Oh, OK, question? Um, <clears throat> so um, you, you want A to be, maybe output more bits? Yeah. yeah, I think you can define it that way. I think for applications, right, so, so the main application here is that we're going we're to, you know, use these pseudorandom distributions to then do things. And for those applications, it's more convenient to have it output a bit. But you could consider generalizations if you like. I, I, it, they, they should end up equivalent. Another question here? Yeah, yeah, you can think about it, actually. And uh, I, I guess I didn't put up a slide like this. But you can think about it, actually, as the attacker knows that what it's trying to do is, is tell whether the string x that it was given was generated by choosing it uniformly or generated by sampling it from d of n. And the attacker you know, is trying to, tell, to get the right answer. You can think of a 1 as indicating a guess that, it's, that it was pseudorandom and, a, and a, that it was generated by d of n, and a, and a 0 as indicating it was sampled uniformly. And the attacker is trying to guess correctly. And this is basically saying that the attacker can't guess correctly better than probability half. It's kind of an equivalent definition. But yeah, the attacker knows the game. The attacker knows the sequence d of n. Uh, the attacker knows what it's trying to do. And still, the attacker can't, can't do it. Yeah? Yeah, I had it on a previous slide. So, so the, a function is negligible if it's asymptotically smaller than any inverse polynomial. Good. Th thank you for the questions. That keeps me honest. Um, OK, so let me introduce now the notion of pseudorandom generators. So roughly speaking, a pseudorandom generator, then, is an efficient deterministic algorithm. Well, basically, it's going to be an algorithm that lets us sample from these distributions dn. So let me turn it around, though. It's going to be an efficient deterministic algorithm that takes as input a short uniform seed and it spits out, it outputs a longer pseudorandom output. Okay, and this is going to be useful whenever we have the ability to sample a small number of truly uniform bits, and we want to then expand those into a much larger sequence of pseudorandom or random looking bits. Um, good. So let G be some deterministic uh, polynomial time algorithm that's expanding. So namely, when we run G on input X, we're going to get output that's of length P of, of length of X. Okay, so think about it like, you know, we run it on an input of length n, we get an output of length n squared. Uh, and here's a picture to go along with that. Okay? So this algorithm, g, right, it's an algorithm, but it defines a sequence of distributions. 
Okay, namely, we can define the distribution dn to be the distribution on pn bit strings defined by sampling a uniform input x and then outputting g of x. Okay, so this algorithm g defines for us an infinite sequence of distributions. Um, and then we'll say that um, g is a pseudorandom generator if that sequence of distributions thus defined is pseudorandom. Okay, or unrolling everything, what that means is that for all efficient distinguishers A, there's a negligible function epsilon such that if you compare the probabilities that A outputs 1 <clears throat> when it's given the output of G when run on a uniform input X, compared to when A is given a truly uniform P of N bit string Y, that difference in probability should be bounded by epsilon. Or coming back to what we were just talking about a minute ago, that means that uh, no attacker, no efficient attacker can distinguish whether it's being given the output of G for a uniform input or whether it's been given a completely uniform bit string. So do these pseudorandom generators exist? Well, it, this comes back to what I talked about earlier when I mentioned uh, assumptions. So we're going to take the existence of pseudorandom generators as an assumption. We don't know whether they exist. Um, we can't currently prove whether they exist or not, because in particular, proving the unconditional existence of a pseudorandom generator would imply p not equal to np. It's actually stronger. We, we believe it's stronger than p not equal to np. Uh, and of course, this is one of the most famous unsolved problems in, in computer science and all of mathematics. Um, we can assume they exist and then build things from them. And in practice, we do have several different algorithms that are believed to be pseudorandom generators. Uh, in the set, well, in, there are many ways you can think about what that means, but at least one, one thing it means is that we have studied them for many years and no one has found any way to, to efficiently distinguish them from, uh, from true uniform uh, bit strings. Uh, you can also construct pseudorandom generators in a provable way from, from weaker assumptions. I mean, ultimately, again, everything would imply p not equal np, so we can't construct them unconditionally, but we can build them uh, from, from, you know, if you like, more believable assumptions or weaker assumptions or whatever you want to call them. And I should have pointed out also that there's a very active uh, line of research on building slightly weaker notions of pseudorandom generators, where rather than, than allowing the distinguisher to run in arbitrary polynomial time, you restrict further what the attacker can do. You might restrict it to running in you know, linear time or, or small space or whatever. And then you can, there are certain um, uh, domains where you can actually construct unconditional pseudorandom generators. Good. So coming back to the one-time pad, right, remember we had this picture uh, where we XOR the message with the key and get a ciphertext, and we said that one of the key disadvantages here was that the key was as long as the message. Well, hopefully I've set you up now to see how we can use pseudorandom generators to get an improved scheme where the key is much, much shorter than the message we're encrypting. Okay, the idea is that we're just going to use a pseudorandom generator to give us the, uh, what we're the mask that we're going to XOR with the message. So let me just break it down here. What we have here is we have an encryption scheme where the key is what's on the upper left. That key is going to be an n-bit string. And we're going to use that key to encrypt a p of n-bit string, uh, sorry, a p of n-bit message. Okay, so it's a little, you know, not exactly clear on the screen, but the key is supposed to be shorter than what we're encrypting. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to, when we want to encrypt a message, we're going to run the key through the pseudorandom generator, right? We evaluate the pseudorandom generator on input the key to get what I'll call a pseudo key, or, or really it's called a mask. And then we're going to XOR that pseudo key with the message in order to get the ciphertext. So again, what we've done is we've replaced a truly uniform key with a pseudo-random key, uh, or you know, a pseudo key. The actual key is n bits long. So the point is right that, that we're sharing an n bit key, but we're encrypting a p of n bit message. We're encrypting some, something longer than what we're sharing. Um, good. So yeah, I just want to highlight, because it's maybe, maybe a little confusing, right? Even though this, this temporary pseudo key that we generate is as long as the message, the point is that we are actually doing better than the one-time pad because the actual key we share and store and generate is only n bits long, which is shorter than what we're encrypting. Yeah? So it's not this whole thing, the generation of the key and the sharing, we assume it's perfect. Yeah, yeah. You cannot on that. Yeah, right. You cannot eavesdrop on that. And, and we'll also assume that the, that the key that the party share is generated uniformly. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. So, so you can think about, and I was going to come back to this a little bit later, you can think about why this is useful. And, and one of the reasons it's useful, right, is because you have situations where two parties are together, you know, today, right, we're together in a room today, we can share a key with nobody watching, and then we go back to our respective homes, and now we're separated, we can only communicate over a channel, now we can communicate securely. Yeah, so this scheme uh, that I'm calling the pseudo one-time pad it, uh, uh, only um, circumvents one of the limitations of the one-time pad. It only circumvents the thing about the key length. It still can only be used, each key can only be used once, and that's still a problem, and we're, and we're still going to want to improve on that. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, I mean, it's hard to generate many keys, and you don't know in advance when we want to talk, and right, we want to fix that. Yes, yeah, so the, the pseudorandom generator, if I go back here, this is just a formal description of the scheme. So the formal description is just that the encryption algorithm, you know, outputs G of K XOR with M. The attacker knows the details of the encryption algorithm, and so in particular, the attacker knows the details of G. Okay, uh, good. So let's see if we can prove it. So this is, again, where things start to get interesting here. Um, we want to prove security of the one-time pad based on the assumption that G is a pseudorandom generator. Okay. So this is really another view, and this was already brought up by a question, right? Another view of what it means for something to be a pseudorandom generator. Uh, we can think about an interactive game involving an adversary that just for this slide I'm calling D for distinguisher. And that, that adversary, what it does is very simple. It just takes as input a string of length P of N, and it cogitates for a while, and then it outputs a bit B. And what it means for, um, a, for an algorithm G to be a pseudorandom generator is that if we compare the behavior of this distinguishing algorithm in two cases, they should be similar. So what are those two situations? Well, one is where we have the string Y being generated from the uniform distribution over P of n bit strings. Okay? And we look again, right, that defines um, uh, the distribution of the bit B. And so we can look at the probability that the bit output by that distinguisher when that distinguisher is fed with a uniform P of n bit string, what's the probability that that output bit is 1, or what's the probability that it's 0? And we can compare that to the probability that B is equal to 1 when uh, we, we uh, sample a uniform key K, run that through the pseudorandom generator, and then feed that as input to our algorithm D. And for any, right, if G is a pseudorandom generator, then for any efficient algorithm D, the probabilities that D outputs 1 in each case have to be close. So now let's give a proof of security for the uh, pseudo one-time pad. We're going to assume G is a pseudorandom generator. We're then going to assume toward a contradiction. So this is just outlining the proof. This is not the proof yet. Uh, we're going to assume toward a contradiction that we have some efficient algorithm A who breaks the pseudo one-time pad scheme. What does it mean to break the scheme? Well, it means according to the definition of computational indistinguishability that we gave earlier the definition of Eve security. So assume we have an attacker who violates that definition. We're then going to use that attacker A as a subroutine to build an efficient distinguisher D that violates or that breaks the pseudorandomness of G. But by our, our assumption in the first step, that should be impossible. And therefore, that tells us that there cannot be an attacker A uh, as in step two. Good. So let's see how this works. So we're going to, uh, this is just another way of thinking about, uh, let me not go through this. OK. So I want to prove then that the pseudo one-time pad is Eve secure. So here's going to be the reduction. So again, we're starting with the assumption that G is a pseudo-random generator. You're giving me an attacker A. I want to prove to you that, that A, um, that this A does not violate the definition of Eve security relative to the pseudo one-time pad encryption scheme. So what is algorithm A? Algorithm A, remember, think back to what the definition of that experiment was. What A does is it outputs a pair of messages, gets back an encryption of one of those two messages where the message was chosen at random, and then tries to guess which of the two things was encrypted. Okay? So we don't know really how, what this A is doing or how it works, but we know it has to satisfy kind of the API of that experiment. So we know that. Um, right, so we're going to wrap this inside. We're going to run it as a subroutine by some algorithm D. Um, right, so again, I'll stress D doesn't know what A is doing, but D knows the interface of A. Okay, D knows that A is going to start out by outputting a pair of messages, and et cetera. D is going to be a distinguisher 
that we're building, okay, we're building it as part of our proof, and we're going to try to use it to distinguish or to determine whether a string y that, we are, that we're given is pseudorandom or random. So d gets as input some value y. What d is then going to do is run a. Okay? So again, we, we can define d to do whatever we like. We can run a as a subroutine because a is an algorithm. We don't know the internal workings of a, but we know the input-output behavior of a. Well, I mean, not behavior, but we know, the, you know what kind of things it outputs, what it expects as input, et cetera. So d is going to run a, and a is going to output a pair of messages m0, m1. Okay? What d is then going to do is it's then going to sample by itself uh, a uniform bit b. It's then going to take the message mb, and as it were, it's going to try to encrypt it using the string y it was given as input. So it's going to take y, it's going to XOR it with mb. That's going to define a quote unquote ciphertext c. We're going to then feed that ciphertext to a. Okay, a is going to then run for a while and then spit out a bit b prime. And then what we do is we check to see whether a's guess was correct, namely whether b prime is equal to b or not. And if, if the guess is correct, we'll output 1. If the guess is not correct, we'll output 0. Okay, so does everyone understand you know, wh where we're going here, right? So A is the attacker we're presented with. Uh, D is the reduction that we're building. We get to define it any which way we like. D is going to be trying to, so A is breaking the encryption scheme, or is claimed to break the encryption scheme. D is now going to try to um, uh, distinguish whether the string Y that it's given is pseudorandom or random. Good. So now let's analyze this distinguisher D. So the first you know, quick thing to check is that D runs in polynomial time. We need it to run in polynomial time because the guarantees of the pseudorandom generator are only for polynomial time distinguishers. So yes, well, if A runs in polynomial time, then so does D, right? Because the only thing D is really doing other than running A is, a, is you know, a, a choosing a random bit and doing like an XOR. So it's really nothing very complicated. So great. Now let me define um, mu of n to be the probability that A uh, succeeds when run in that experiment prive k. Right? That's the experiment defining uh, Eve's security. Okay, so I'm just defining mu of n to be that value so I don't have to write it every time. So the claim is that when y is generated, right, y is the input to d, when y is generated by sampling a uniform x and then computing y equals g of x, then the view of A is exactly the same the distribution of the view of A really is exactly identical as the distribution of its view in that experiment prive k. Okay, why is that? Because the experiment of the of the sorry the view of the attacker when running in that experiment is exactly that. Um, it outputs two messages. One of them is chosen at random. It's XORed with g of k for some random k, uh, and then it's give, it's given that result, and then it outputs a bit b prime. It's exactly identical to what's going on when A is attacking the pseudo one-time pad encryption scheme. And therefore, the probability, or, or therefore, the distribution on the bit output by A is exactly identical to the distribution of that bit when run in that randomized experiment, prive k. And so the probability that D outputs 1, okay, which happens if and only if the attacker's guess B prime is equal to B, is exactly equal to mu of n. Okay, the probability that the, that the distinguisher outputs 1 in that case is exactly mu of n. When the, when the input of the distinguisher is uh, generated using the pseudorandom generator G. Okay. And this is just the picture, really. I mean, so this is the picture of what happens when the input to D is generated as output of a pseudorandom generator. Uh, and then you can see just by you know, changing where the boxes are, it's really just you know, the view of A there. This, 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 inside this box is exactly experiment prive K for, for the scheme pi being the pseudo one-time pad. Um, good. So now the other case of interest is what happens when the input to D is a uniformly generated bit string? What happens when Y is uniformly generated? So I claim that in that case, uh, A will succeed, namely B prime is equal to B with probability exactly one half. And this is going to be regardless of what A is doing or what algorithm A is. So how do I know that? Well, because in that case, what you can see, let's see if I have another animation, right? So now the input to D is generated by choosing y uniformly. Well, in that case, the experiment becomes exactly equivalent to what? It becomes exactly equivalent 
to running A in the prive K experiment, but not with the pseudo one-time pad anymore, but with the, with the one-time pad itself. Because now we've changed the distribution of Y to be a uniform string. So this is just the one-time pad encryption scheme. And we said that the one-time pad encryption scheme, for the one-time pad encryption scheme, no adversary A, regardless of what it does, regardless of its running time, regardless of anything else, can succeed with probability any different from 1 half. So in this case, the probability that B prime equals B is exactly 1 half. And so the probability that D outputs 1 is exactly 1 half. OK, so putting this all together, right, we have that the probability that D outputs 1 uh, when, when, uh, when fed G of X is exactly mu of N. The probability that D outputs 1 when it's given a uniform string is exactly 1 half. By assumption, G is a pseudorandom generator. And so the difference in those two probabilities has to be negligible. OK, D is the running in polynomial time. So that difference has to be negligible. That tells us that mu of N minus 1 half is negligible. Uh, and therefore, uh, the probability that prive k evalu evaluates to 1 is bounded by 1 half plus negligible, which is exactly what we needed to show. Uh, this is, that's exactly the definition of Eve's security. Okay, A was arbitrary, so this shows that for all A, uh, all bounded running time A, the pro th that probability is bounded by 1 half plus negligible. Okay. So questions about that? That was, that was the, um, especially for people new to this, that idea of a proof by reduction is something that takes some getting used to, but this is really the bread and butter of, all, of, of most cryptographic uh, proofs. So it's important to kind of understand that template now. Questions? OK, good. Um, so let's see. Um, right, so this point came up earlier that the pseudo one-time pad still has many, uh, still has the other limitation of the one-time pad, namely that a given key can only be used once. And so really what we want to do is consider stronger notions of security. And I just wanted to show here, I'm not going to do much with some of these, but I want to show you that you can consider stronger notions of security. So we had, right, this is the same picture as before, where we had this notion of single message security against a ciphertext only attack. Namely, we're looking at an attacker that can only eavesdrop on the channel and just observe a single ciphertext. We can obviously extend that definition to consider the case where uh, one of the parties is encrypting multiple messages, and maybe even some unbounded but polynomial number of messages. So in this case, right, we'll allow uh, the attacker perhaps to specify um, a vector, pairs of vectors uh, of messages one of which is selected at random, and then the honest party goes down the line encrypting those messages in the vector one by one, and the attacker gets to observe all the ciphertexts. This would be a notion corresponding to what I might call multiple message security. Um, another notion, which is even stronger, is called CPA security, and this stands for security against chosen plain text attacks. The idea here is that the attacker might be able, in the real world, to influence what one of the honest parties encrypts. And so we're going to model that by allowing the attacker to actually specify exactly what, what gets encrypted some number of times. So the idea would be that the attacker can specify, can tell one of the parties, please encrypt message M1. And then the party goes ahead and encrypts it and sends it across the channel. The attacker then gets to observe that ciphertext C1 corresponds to message M1. Right? The attacker knows the message and the ciphertext in that case for the particular key being used. Um, that same key might then be used for another message. So the attacker might specify encrypt M2. Uh, that party will <clears throat> use the same key as before to encrypt M2 and send the ciphertext across the channel. Uh, and then at some later point in time, right, some unknown message M is encrypted using the same key. Right, it's the same key throughout the whole experiment. Uh, and then we'd still like to claim that the attacker doesn't learn anything about M from the ciphertext C that it observed even after having been able to observe the fact that C1 corresponds to M1 and C2 corresponds to M2, et cetera. You set me up perfectly for the next slide. Uh, let's see. Oh, no, not the next slide. The next five slides from now. Um, let me just define this game more formally. So um, uh, right, what we'll do is we'll just uh, add this notion called an oracle will give the attacker A the ability to, add with an to interact with an encryption oracle. Uh, 
where, the, where what it can do basically is we imagine that it has a black box. It can hand a message M to that box and get back an encryption of M uh, using the, the same key K that's going to be chosen in step one and then fixed for the remainder of the experiment. Uh, it can interact with that oracle as many times as it likes. And then eventually, the same kind of thing as before, it's going to output a pair of messages, M0, M1. Um, one of them is going to be chosen and encrypted. The attacker gets that ciphertext. We'll allow the attacker to continue to interact with the encryption oracle. And then still, the attacker will try to output a guess B prime, succeed if B prime is equal to B. And we'll say that um, uh, you know, the, the scheme is CPA secure if for all A in that model, the probability that A, that, sorry, the probability that the experiment evaluates to one is at most one half plus negligible. Now, right, so there's a question, right? The claim is, or I think, that it's impossible to achieve this definition, right? So why is it impossible to achieve the definition? Well, because presumably uh, if the message were to be equal to M1, you would see the ciphertext for M1, and then you'd be able to check whether Yeah, so, so the observation is that there's an attack, right, uh, that works for any scheme. And the attack is the following. What we're going to do is we're going to interact with the encryption oracle, pick arbitrary M0, M1 that are different, um, interact with the encryption oracle, get an encryption of M0, call it C0, get an encryption of M1, call it C1. Now I'm going to output as my pair of messages M0, M1. I'm going to get back a ciphertext C, and if C is equal to C0, I'll output 0, otherwise I'll output 1. Okay? What's the uh, probability that the uh, experiment evaluates to 1 in this case? Well, it seems like it's going to be 1, which is far away from 1 half. Okay? However, right, that's not exactly true, right? That attack only works if the encryption scheme is deterministic. So what about if the encryption scheme is randomized, right? What does it mean for the encryption scheme to be randomized? Well, that would mean that even when I encrypt the same message M0 multiple times using the same key, I'm going to potentially get back different ciphertexts every time. And if the encryption scheme is randomized and there are many different ciphertexts that can be output for any particular message, even when using the same key, then this attack no longer works, or at least it doesn't work with probability 1. And so what that tells you, actually, is that if you want to hope to achieve CC CPA security, you need, you must have randomized encryption. Right? Deterministic encryption won't cut it. So we're going to have to see, then, how we can build randomness into uh, an encryption scheme in order to achieve this definition. But, but looking ahead, actually, we can achieve the definition with a randomized scheme. Questions uh, now? Good. Um, so I think I'll probably have time in the remaining 10 minutes to, to uh, discuss pseudorandom functions and then show a randomized encryption scheme that's CPA secure. So this is kind of a, a pseudorandom function is kind of a strengthening of the notion of pseudorandom generators. And we can start, again, by thinking about a random function and what a random function might mean. And what I mean here is, again, it doesn't make sense to talk about any particular function as being a random function. What we mean when we talk about a random function is uh, sampling a function uniformly from some space of possible functions. So really, we're going to fix some finite domain and range, uh, and then which, which, um, uh, which then defines a finite set of functions mapping inputs from that domain to uh, outputs of that range and then sampling uniformly from that set of functions. Um, and so in particular, once we select that function from that, from that collection of all possible functions, there's no more randomness involved at that point. Right now, if we query, in particular, if we query that function twice on the same input, we're going to get the same output. So I, I wanted to stress that it's, it's a little bit different. Right? A randomized algorithm, you query it with the same input twice, you might get different outputs. A random function is like we sample a random function, but, but it's a deterministic function that we're sampling. And so if we query it twice, we get the same value each time. Uh, good, so this is just some basic stuff, you know, counting the number of functions. Uh, uh, so the, the final result is if we look at all functions mapping n-bit strings to n-bit strings, the size of that set is 2 to the n, 2 to the n. So it's large, but, you know, it's some finite set. <clears throat> Uh, so we can choose, this is what I said earlier, we can choose it. So, so one way to choose a uniform function is just to pick a uniform function from that set and then fix it. Uh, but another way that's often useful to think about, both, you know, uh, well, both conceptually but also when you're doing proofs sometimes, is to think about uh, leaving the function undefined until it's queried at a particular point. And then when it's queried at a particular point, you choose the output at that point 
uniformly at random if it wasn't queried already. And then you fill it in in a table for bookkeeping so that if the same input is queried later on, you'll return the same output. So you start out with a, with a blank you know, table, and then every time you query, you fill in the corresponding space, and, you, and then the next time you check if it was queried before. <clears throat> but, and these are equivalent viewpoints for picking a random function. Good. So now a pseudorandom function should be a distribution on functions that looks like uh, what you would get if you sampled a random function. So what does it mean, then, to have a distribution on functions? So we can, we can define that via the notion of a keyed function. So a keyed function is, that I'm writing here by capital F, is a function on two inputs where we're going to think about the first input as a key and the second input as like an actual input. And it's going to be, um, as always, need to be something that's evaluatable by uh, an efficient deterministic algorithm. And then we're going to define right, f sub k of x. So f sub k is going to be the reduced function where we fix the first input to k. And I just for simplicity, I'm going to assume that f is length preserving, meaning that um, you know, it takes a key of length n and an input of length n and produces an output of length n. And it can do that for every integer value of n. So the observation now is that picking a uniform key k and then looking at the function f sub k defines a distribution on functions. Right? Uh, we're basically, um, uh, well, the algorithm f defines a distribution on functions within the set uh, func n, which I defined on a previous slide as the set of all functions from n-bit inputs to n-bit outputs. Now remember, though, right, the number of functions in func n was doubly exponential. It was 2 to the n, 2 to the n. The number of different functions that I can access by picking some key is exactly 2 to the n. So we're basically looking at a very small set of size 2 to the n, a very small subset of the set of all possible functions from n-bit inputs to n-bit outputs. And by picking a uniform key, assuming all those functions are distinct, we're, we're basically picking a uniform element, but only from that subset of the larger space. So it's really only a tiny fraction of the set of all functions. And we'll say that this um, keyed function f is a pseudorandom function if f sub k for a uniform choice of key is indistinguishable from a uniform function in that larger set. So basically, sampling a function from that smaller set, that subset of a func n, should give something that's indistinguishable from sampling from the larger set func n. Uh, and formally, we're going to define that by, again, looking at distinguishers given oracle access to functions. So we have now a polynomial time distinguisher d where it's either given access to f sub k for a uniform choice of k, or it's given access to f, where f is chosen uniformly from the space of all functions. And we'll say that capital F is, uh, is a pseudorandom function if the difference in the probability is that d outputs 1 in both those cases is bounded by some negligible function. Uh, so again, right, whether these exist or not, we don't know. Um, uh, we, we have candidates that we believe to be pseudorandom functions. We can build them, in fact, from pseudorandom generators. But ultimately, it's an assumption that we have to uh, work with and then try to build schemes from that assumption. Let me, uh, well, OK, this is another way to think about it. So here we have you know, a distinguisher uh, d running in polynomial time. And what we're doing when we talk about a pseudorandom function is we're comparing two different worlds that this attacker might run in. So in the first world, what we do is we pick a function uniformly at random from the space of all functions. We put it inside of a box, and we allow the attacker to interact with that box. Right? It can give an input x1, receive the corresponding output, give x2, get the corresponding output, et cetera. It can do that as long as it likes, although it won't have time to query the function on, on all points because it's bounded to running in polynomial time. The number of inputs is going to be 2 to the n. The attacker can only query a negligible fraction of those because it's bounded to running in polynomial time. And then we can compare that to the case where what we put inside the box is just a uniform key k and then an implementation of fk. And the attacker can interact like in the upper picture. And basically, the, at the end of the day, the attacker should not be able to tell which of these two worlds it's running in. Okay, or the uh, formally, right, the distribution of the bit output by the adversary is uh, close in both of those worlds. <clears throat> so let me finish with a, a, a description of a CPA secure encryption scheme from any pseudorandom function. 
Um, the core idea here is, right, just like in the case of the uh, pseudo one-time pad, where we replaced the mask with a pseudo, with a, we replaced a uniform mask with a pseudo random mask or pad, we want to do the same thing here, but we want to somehow generate multiple masks from a single key. Okay, and we can do that, if we can do that, that will be good because then that will basically allow us to get like an unbounded length key, an unbounded length mask rather, from a single short key. And we're going to do that using a pseudorandom function. So what we'll do is we'll have the party share a uniform key k, and we'll define now the encryption of m in the following way. What the sender will do is it will pick a random n-bit string r, and it will then send the ciphertext consisting of r itself, and then fk of r xor with m. So notice that the ciphertext now is twice the length of the message. And the receiver, to decrypt a pair, uh, a, a pair of, of strings, c1, c2, which is just one ciphertext, is going to just compute fk on c1 itself, and then XOR that with c2 to recover the message. So in pictures, right, this is what you basically have. You have the same kind of core picture as before, where we're XORing a message with a pseudorandom string. But now we're generating multiple different pseudorandom strings by picking a fresh random value r every time we encrypt. And then we're enabling decryption by sending r as part of the ciphertext. Good. And the theorem is that if f is a pseudorandom function, then this scheme is CPA secure. I won't have time for the proof, but I, I just will kind of give a summary of the idea of the proof. Uh, it's again going to be a proof for, by reduction, showing that for any adversary attacking the scheme, we can build uh, a distinguisher for the pseudorandom function f. And the basic idea is because f is a pseudorandom function, we can replace, we can think about replacing fk with a truly random function f. Okay? You have to justify it, but you know, it works pretty smoothly. And that's again by the assumption that f is a that capital F is a pseudorandom function. Now, let's evaluate the scheme when, the, when we imagine that the parties actually share a completely random function f. Well, whenever that function f is evaluated on a new input, the resulting output value is uniform and independent of anything else. So as long as the sender is always ever applying f on a new input value, um, you can basically show that the security of the scheme reduces to, secure, to the security of the one-time pad. So we can bound the attacker's success probability, assuming f is never evaluated on the same input twice. And then the only thing left to do is to bound the probability that f is evaluated on the same input twice. And that's just a simple probabilistic calculation that has nothing to do with cryptography per se. It's just a, a collision probability calculation. Um, so I think, I think you know, maybe you got the idea. We can talk about it over the break, perhaps. But I think this is probably a good place to stop. Just to summarize, what you get is something like the probability that A can succeed. Uh, this, is a, this is for the case when the, when the parties, when we imagine they share a completely random function, is going to be bounded by 1 half plus Q of n over 2 to the n, where, where Q of n over 2 to the n corresponds to the probability, now not of a repeat, but the probability that for the single challenge ciphertext that's given to A, the R value used there was used in some prior query by the adversary. And if we assume the number of queries by the adversary is at most Q of n, where Q is some polynomial, then that's exactly Q of n over 2 to the n. Uh, let me just point out, right, Q of n over 2 to the n is negligible because Q is polynomial because the attacker's running time is bounded to be polynomial. 2 of n is exponential, so Q of n over 2 to the n is negligible. Good. Let me stop there. I think it's a good place to stop. Um, I'm happy to take some questions over the break. When we come back, um, we'll have to see you know, exactly what we cover, but I'll, uh, I'll come up with something.